Hey, this is Ebony Adedayo. I am um, the founder of the Kinky Curly Theological Collective and a pastor in Columbia Heights here in Minnesota. And I'm Steve Kimes, pastor of Anawim Christian Community, uh, a uh, community church for the homeless in Portland, and, Oregon. And this is Black Gal, White Gal. Um, a podcast where we get an opportunity to talk about the intersection of our faith in Jesus Christ, our role as ministers, and social justice, and some of the things that really make our heart beat. So welcome to our 12th, 11th podcast? 12th. 12th. Thank you, Steve, um, with Black Owl, White Guy. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, a houseless crisis in Portland, Oregon, but before we get into the meat of our discussion, Steve, I want to ask you if you have any recommendations. I do. I've got a really interesting book uh, that I want to recommend to people. It is called Faith in the Face of Empire, the Bible Through Palestinian Eyes. Um, and it is a book by Mitri Raheb. Uh, and he is a Christian uh, who lives in day Bethlehem. Uh, and he is talking about what does it what is it like to be a Christian and to he's kind of writing it to us who live in the West saying I have some things to tell you about Israel and about Palestine from my perspective as a Christian uh, living here in Bethlehem Bethlehem is Palestinian area mm -hmm. And uh, he's a Palestinian Christian who helps to uh, teach and uh, lead a Bible school there in uh, there in Bethlehem. And he's like, well, you guys are are focusing a lot on what Israel says about Palestine and what Israel's perspective, but we have a very different perspective. We're looking at things. Uh, we're looking at things really differently. And he says, "I want to know why it is that you're only listening to that side mm. and not to this other side." And it's a really short book. It's only about 130 pages. Okay. Um, and I really recommend it. That doesn't mean that people are going to agree with everything he has to say. But the fact is, is that he is a brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. He is a different perspective on things that really that all of, almost all of us have an opinion one way or the other about Israel and he's like well how many of you have actually read anything from a Palestinian Christian or how many of you have heard the the perspective of a Palestinian Christian on the crisis between Palestine and Israel and and so I really recommend this book. Once again, not because we're going to agree with everything, but because it is really important for us as Christians to hear another voice from a Christian perspective. So once again, that is faith mm. in the face of empire, the Bible through Palestinian eyes. I highly recommend that. That's really awesome. Um, that sounds like a book that I want to read as well. <laughs> um, so we'll get it in the notes so that um, for those who are, following our podcast and those like me who want to turn back to it so I can get that book and write it down so I can read it and become wiser. Um, we have that available. So the resource I want to recommend, I actually want to recommend Dominique Gillard's um, book, Rethinking Incarceration. It actually doesn't come out until um, February 6th. I'm on the, um, like the promotion launch team and I've already started reading it and it's really, really good. Um, it's, 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 a, it's an amazing book. I feel like this book is follows up on where Michelle Alexander left off with the new Jim Crow. And in addition to talking about um, our incarceration system from the lens that Alexander presents, Gillard, his work is unique, or not necessarily unique, but is special and apart from Alexander because he really waves in what the church's responsibility should be to incarceration. And so I've just started reading it, I started reading it last week, and I'm really looking forward to finishing it. I'm, I'm really excited to hear his voice in this time because we know that incarceration is a mess. It's not just, I mean, you have police brutality, you have mass incarceration, you have the war on drugs, you have all these different things that disproportionately target and harm are African-American men and increasingly African-American women. And so to have someone like Gillard 
come out and tell it the way it is so that people in the church can have something to attach themselves to and a theological framework that we can begin to build and do advocacy from is really important. So that there's my recommendation. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to looking at that. Absolutely. So we are gonna get into our discussion today. Um, Steve, you have been telling me offline and on Facebook about um, some events and protests in Portland regarding the forced removal and displacement of your houseless population. Um, could you share a little bit about what is going on, what has happened, and what is a houseless population? So, so houseless is uh, a uh, is a word that uh, a lot of advocates are using instead of homeless. Um, when people think of homeless people, a lot of times they're automatically thinking negatively about them, or they're they're throwing in a lot of stereotypes. So some people are using the term houseless. Other people are using the terms economic refugees, which I personally think is a more accurate term. Um, but it doesn't really flow off the lips so well as houseless or homeless. So, you know, uh, and I find that most homeless folks don't really care uh, uh, which one we use. So so this is kind of an advocacy uh, in-house argument. Uh -huh. um, but uh, what's been going on, especially over the last couple of years, and I'm just going to talk about Portland, but I, even though I'm talking about Portland, this is pretty much... Uh, a similar case, whether you're talking about Seattle or San Francisco or San Diego or Los Angeles, all up and down the West Coast, it's it's pretty similar to this. Uh, and so what's been going on the last couple years is, uh, on the one hand, many of the cities have been declaring that uh, homelessness and housing issues are an emergency crisis. Many cities throughout the United States uh, mm -hmm. are declaring that. And that is so that way they would be able to access emergency funds and uh, federal funds to be able to help the uh, help those in that crisis. And so, and then what happens is after they declare that there's an emergency crisis, so like Portland declared that, but other groups, other cities, so like a suburb of Portland called Gresham. Uh, decided right after the emergency crisis in Portland was declared that they were going to work to move out every single houseless person they have and move them out of the city. Since mm -hmm. they share a really long uh, border with Portland, uh, they just made, uh, made it so that way houseless people in Gresham were no longer welcome. As soon as they set up a camp, a day later, the police would show up and say, you need to move now. Uh, now, legally, they have to give them a, a notice, a 72-hour notice, and uh, and uh, have them move within 72 hours. But basically, they would get them right as soon as the camp was built. The reason, and the way that they would do that is they'd have drones. They have drones that fly around the city looking for new ho houseless camps that pop up. So every time they see a camp pop up, the police are there first thing next day. Say, okay. Um, uh, thank you for visiting Gresham. It's time for you to go now. Uh, and so they keep doing that until finally they all the people that uh, became houseless in Gresham, all the people that uh, were that were having to come into Gresham, any people who uh, who just became houseless in Gresham, they, every single one is moving out and being forced to move into Portland. Portland is doing something similar. Uh, it's a much larger area, and they have a much uh, larger houseless population. Uh, so what they've mm -hmm. done is they have hired two organizations uh, to that are cleaning organizations to go to pick up mm -hmm. and to throw away houseless people's camps. So, uh, for instance, we have uh, one organization name rapid response and they would go and talk to somebody so they'd go and talk to somebody or they uh, and then they'd find out where the camp is wait until that person is not in camp and then sneak to their camp and take everything and so when they come back to their camp it's all gone everything's gone their tents their sleeping bags all that now they're supposed to hold it for 30 days according to oregon law 
and they and because uh, some advocates have challenged them on this they have started to uh, they have started to go ahead and, and save things for 30 days, um, although that is still yet to be tested. So we're going to find out whether they're actually doing that. Or not. Uh, but you're supposed to be able to, any houseless person is supposed to be able to say, well, this and this and this is mine. Uh, so I want that back. And they say, OK, it's not 30 days yet. So we haven't thrown that away so we can get that back uh, to you. Um, but they make it very difficult. For instance, like uh, one of the organizations that do a lot in northern Portland, or in East Portland, their uh, headquarters is actually in another city uh, outside of Portland. So you'd have to take an all-day trip uh, on the bus to Oregon City and back in order to get your possessions back. And the reason that they're doing this, and it used to be that there would be sweeps in Portland maybe once or maybe two times a year, maybe three times a year at most, but now it is continuous 52 weeks a year monday through friday nine to five all year round pushing homeless people from one place to another to another to another uh, and without any stop without any rest so that way uh, a single camp or a single uh, houseless person might end up having to move uh every week or uh, or a couple times a month and have their uh, possessions threatened or, or taken from them all of uh, once or all of those times. Wow, that's such a that's such an awful situation. But it doesn't seem. I mean, as you're describing what is going on, it seems like there's been a culture around displacing the houseless population, and you have reached a tipping point of crisis. What has been what is, well, you talked about uh, the uh, Portland dec declaring a housing crisis. And I actually was not familiar with the fact that the reasons why cities did that was to get resources, not necessarily to actually spend it on the populations that are most vulnerable, which is, which is awful because you hear cities talk about, you know, this housing problem. We have reports after reports and assessments after assessments that talk about our housing and our homeless problem. But the analysis that you provided me with really helps me to understand reasons why you do that is to get resources, not necessarily to solve the problem. It's, the, it's a really prime example of the nonprofit industrial complex, that we do these things to get resources, not necessarily to solve the problem, which is, which is awful. I, I don't even know what to say in response to um, what people are facing. And I know that this is your ongoing work. And so you've been intimately involved in advocating and providing relief. So what is the next step for you? What's the next step for, um, for Portland? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that has happened, and it's not that uh, this is not necessarily from the cities, but a lot of there were, there were a lot of community centers that provided a lot of day shelters uh, for the main populations of houseless people. So for instance, my church was a day shelter that was open uh, three days a week uh, in the city of Gresham. We ended up being shut down. There's another day shelter that's been in Southeast Portland for years and years and years, and they had a fire. They ended up shutting down. So a lot of these day shelters are no longer available. Um, and overnight shelters are very limited. In fact, there isn't a single city in the United States that have enough emergency overnight shelters to house all of their houseless population. So some people are going to be missed uh, no matter what. So the next step is, uh, the next step that, that we advocates think are necessary is to establish villages. So to establish a, uh, a place for people who are on the street, people who are ready to move off the street, but they don't, they are having trouble accessing uh, services, they're having trouble accessing uh, uh, people to help them and transportation. So they can move into a village, have advocates to, us, to help them uh, access the services and help them get on the phone uh, and just live in these places. And these places are safe, no one gets swept in a village. Uh, people are people move in, they are 
they stay there and they access services. And then within about nine months, they're ready to, nine months or less, they're ready to transition off the street into a place uh, of their own. So that way they can do that. There are people right now who are on the street in every city in the United States who receive disability. There's no, uh, there are people on the street in every city in the United States that uh, have uh, veterans benefits. None of these people should be on the street. All they have to do is access the services and move off. Now, of course, there's always some people, a smaller group of people who uh, will never be ready to move off the street for one way or the other. And those aren't the folks that I'm talking about that would necessarily access villages. Uh, but, uh, but the people who are like, well, I, I've been trying to do this and this and this. I've been trying to get these steps going and I just can't seem to do it. Those are the folks that we want in the villages uh, to be able to help organize the villages and then uh, and then move out into their own place. And we've seen this work. In fact, in Eugene, Oregon, this model is already working right now. They have about four of these villages in Eugene uh, and that is working. We have models like that similar to that in Portland, but some of them are rest areas only at night, so people can't stay there during the day. So they're still they're still vulnerable during the day, and some of them are uh, are permanent places where people could live, but they're not focused on social services getting people off the street. So this one is so this particular model is kind of an in between because we can have housing for folks on the street and not have the folks on the street actually access those housing um, because it's difficult to difficult to connect to those folks or it's difficult for them to fill out the paperwork. They need people who are there with them all the time to help them move along the process. So that's what a village is intending to do. So can you help me understand um, like what what that means when you say village? So I know you have these these camps that you set up that get in, raided and torn down. What's the difference between that and a village? And how does it become more sustainable so that it doesn't get torn down? Because as I understand it, it's probably an illegal, um, an illegal though helpful uh, solution. Um, so uh, as far as uh, the difference between a camp and a village, um, a village has structures uh, to make it more permanent. So it's not just a bunch of tents on the ground. There are platforms, there are com there's uh, community centers for people to go to, there's a kitchen, there's porta potties, uh, there's a dumpster. Uh, so a village is cleaner, a village, uh, a village protects the environment instead of damaging the environment, um, and a village, uh, a village is a safer place to live because you have people who are managing and people who are helping uh, folks uh, both walk through the process of getting off the street, but also uh, to help uh, protect the camp from uh, from people who may want to take advantage of folks in the camp, uh, whether that be through violence, through selling drugs, through uh, other types of activity, or trying to come and take people's possessions. There are people there who will protect them and say, no, you can't come in here and do this. This isn't your place. Mm. <clears throat> um, and so the thing about a, a camp is that everybody's tent is completely vulnerable to anybody who wants to come in. Uh, nobody can stop them from doing that. If you have to go make an appointment across town and you're going to be gone all day, nobody is, everyone is upset, but no one is really surprised that they come back and find that their tent has been rifled through and a lot of their important survival possessions have been taken. Mm. So that's the difference kind of between a camp and a village. A village is protected. Mm -hmm. It's watched over with people to help you survive. And okay. they can't you're on your own. Okay. How do you keep it from being torn down at the same time by um, authorities or officers who who don't like that it's there, by government officials, by by residents who just are so antagonistic towards um, the houseless population? So we'll have uh, we'll have people who are watching as security for people who just want to come in and cause vandalism. 
uh, for authorities, any authority who will have who will want to move us, they have to by law post a seventy-two hour notice. So that means we have at least three days to uh, work on trying to get that notice taken away. Mm. So they can post a seventy-two hour notice up there, and then we can talk to their authorities, uh, the department, the city department that owns the land. The only it, uh, the, the thing is, is uh, if camping is illegal, then existing as a person who can't afford a home is illegal, which means that homelessness is illegal. If, they, if you become homeless, you are now a illegal person. Now, courts would say, no, people who are, who are without homes cannot be illegal. Um, but there are many laws that criminalize uh, the activity that homeless uh, folks do. So, for instance, many cities have sit lie laws, which make it illegal to sit down or lay down on a sidewalk mm -hmm. or on any public land. Now, uh, if you are a family, uh, if you're a family of three, and you go out to the park and you lay down a uh, lay down a tablecloth and you're sitting down on the park and you're having a picnic or whatever, then nobody's going to have any problem with that. But if you look homeless, mm -hmm. then a police officer would have the right to go and say, no, I'm sorry, it is illegal for you to be in this park and sit down in this park. You have mm -hmm. to walk through. Uh, that's what sit lies do, which make it illegal or they criminalize being without a house. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, a person may not wow. be able to sleep. So it's actually what these things are doing are criminalizing sleep, um, criminalizing rest. Uh, anyway, and so what we can do is we can say, what is it that we are doing illegal? What is it that we're doing illegal? We have people who are here and they are sleeping and they are resting. Are you going to say, are you as a public official going to say that sleep or rest is illegal? No public official wants to say that because that's when the courts get involved. That's when things get really nasty. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're actually challenging the theft of possessions on a, by, official channel, by official channels. We are challenging the sit-lie laws, mm -hmm. which make it illegal to rest. Uh, and we're saying, well, we're going to be here, and this is illegal, and if you want to uh, strip away our legal right to sit and to rest in a public area, then let's go ahead and let's take this to court. And right. let's uh, let's have a judge uh, determine uh, who, uh, who's right in this case and what's, what's really going on. Mm -hmm. and this is really what we would like to do. We'd like to have it uh, taken to court. Uh, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have a problem with that. But honestly, what we really want to do is have a space to help people on the yeah. street to live a better life. So if they leave us alone, we're perfectly willing to be allowed to just stay there and move on into uh, and move the people on into places that are going to help them. Right. Well, I mean, it sounds like a huge, huge task. And so my prayers are with you and your team as you continue to move this work forward. But in addition to prayers, what else can people do, particularly those listening to this podcast who may not live in Portland? What can we do as a um, people who are committed to this cause, whether we're believers or not? Um, I don't know if it was actually said, but we are actually starting a village. Uh, we're going to start one of these villages uh, in just about a week. Uh, we're going to start the building and all that. So uh, we're starting it. We're going to be having our open house on January 29th. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, 29th. So, uh, and that's going to be our public opening and letting people know exactly where it is and all that. But if you happen to be watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and you're saying, gosh, I would really like to help. I'd like to see this kind of uh, this kind of thing happen. Then, yes, we really do need prayers. I'm serious. We really want prayers. We're going to be... Uh, we're going to be uh, challenging the status quo uh, uh, face to face, and we really need people to pray against the powers that are trying Amen. to tear down the poorest people who live in our area. Um, 
Also, though, uh, if you're not in the area, another thing that you can do, um, you can uh, help us financially. There are avenues uh, to do that. But even more than that, you can actually help buy supplies that we're going to use in the village, uh, buy the kinds of things that we need to, to help people live. So if anybody contacts me personally, if you contact my me over email, and my email is stevekimes at aol.com. So Steve, just like Steve Kimes, K-I-M as in Mary E-S at AOL.com. And yes, I know AOL is really old and hardly anybody is using AOL anymore, but I still use it. I've had it for 25 years and I'm happy with the AOL. Okay, anyway, so Steve, if you contact me at StateTimes at AOL.com, then, uh, then I can give you the list of supplies that we need. Uh, and if anybody would like to purchase any of those and send them to us, we'd be really happy uh, to receive that. It's an Amazon list. So you could just pick one, buy it on Amazon, and send it to us. Um, or if you wanted to know how you can uh, support us financially, so that way we are able to, uh, to help or to establish, sustain this, and to pay our houseless managers who are going to be overseeing uh, the camp. We have both housed and houseless managers uh, who've been chosen to to do this work, uh, and uh, and so we want to pay them salary. We also need some basic supplies, and we need to keep paying for the dumpsters and paying for the porta potties and all of that kind of stuff. If anyone like to supply us with some uh, financial donations, once again, contact me at a at stevekimes at aol .com, and I'd be happy to give you the information so you know uh, how to help us. That is great. And um, we, we'll be praying and we'll be offering up contributions as we are, as we are able. Um, that's what we have today, y'all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning into our 12th podcast. If you have any questions or comments, if you have ideas for future discussions, please be sure to email, email us at bgwg at middlenerds.com. Again, that email address is bgwg at middlenerds.com. Um, that's it. Have a really great night um, and be well. Amen. Amen. Hey, everyone. This is Paul Walker. If you like what you just heard, be sure to check out more of what we have to offer at mentalnerds.com. It's the hub for all things mental nerds. From there, you can learn more about these podcasts, syndicated blogs from people all over the world, books authored by some of our members, and a host of other exciting free resources for you and your church. Now, there's one last thing. Uh, what we do costs a bit of money, and we're always doing it on a volunteer basis. We have people that are committed to making this happen, but we could use more people. If you like what we do, please consider donating monthly. We have two options. You can either do a monthly donation through Patreon, or you can give a one-time donation at any time through PayPal. We love the work we do, but we do need your help to keep it going and to expand into new territory. If you would like to donate, check out menonerds.com slash donate. Thanks for listening, and as always, have a great day.